PSYOP, the Single Integrated Operating Plan. This here is a conception of the Aurora Stealth Recce Vehicle, which may or may not have ever existed, although there were alleged sightings from oil platforms in the North Sea. The Single Integrated Operational Plan. Before PSYOP existed, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the U.S. had uncoordinated planning. This led to massive duplication and triplication of targets and possible inadvertent fratricide between nuclear warheads. Between 1955 and 1960, the U.S. increased the number of its warheads from 1,000 to 18,000 warheads and the number of Soviet targets from 3,000 to 20,000. It included 118 cities as targets. 645 primary and 320 secondary airfields. So the steps that led to the PSYOP was a need to coordinate nuclear attacks for preemption, which would take a couple of days in the 1950s. We think of launching nuclear weapons as relatively easy. The US president would simply call the Joint Chiefs of Staff and say, launch all the nuclear weapons. But many nuclear weapons are under maintenance. So to do a preemptive attack, and to make sure the weapons are all launching, you need to ensure that all the maintenance is done. And this requires a lot of coordination because there's a very complex set of maintenance schedules. Where are the bombers deployed? Is there an inspection cycle? Are soldiers elsewhere training? Where are the submarines deployed? It's complex. So the main problem was, it was impossible for the political authorities to have control over the battle and difficult for the military to coordinate operations. It's one thing to launch all the missiles at the same time, but what if the next day you wanted to hit a particular set of targets in a particular region? How would you do it? If there was a threat, for example, in the middle of the Sahara Desert, none of the ICBMs could hit it. They weren't designed to hit a target that close or they didn't have the tapes for the target in that location. Creating the tape could take a day or several hours. This is the US Global Attack Plan in 1957, which is mostly based on bombers. And you can see just east of the Ural Mountains in the Soviet Union, there's an area which was unreachable by US aircraft. This is one of the reasons why the US prized the air base at Peshawar in Pakistan. It gave them access to the interior of the Soviet Union. So the first PSYOP, PSYOP 1960. The first PSYOP developed by Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy and was planned in detail. And this process continued, continued until 1992 by the Joint Strategic Targeting Planning Staff. Its initial target set was the Soviet Union and China. The target set, which is called the NSTL, the National Strategic Target List, for PSYOP later drove the government procurement cycle. So if the government wanted to justify a weapon system, they need to refer back to the PSYOP and a gap that they perceived in the PSYOP. But the process was not always well supervised. The target list of 4,100 sites became 2,600 installations in 1,050 design designated ground zeros, each of which could have multiple incoming weapons to and coordinated to avoid fratricide. So the process was targets received points for command and manufacturing and the computer allocated the weapons. Initially, people didn't think it put enough nuclear weapons on Moscow, so they changed it. The problem was even after PSYOP, there was an absence of supervision because the Joint Chiefs of Staff did not have the computers or the specialized personnel to review the plans. As mentioned earlier, one of the developments during this period was SCATANA, security control for air traffic and navigation aids. This is the order where you have to clear the skies for bombers and ICBM operations by compelling all civilian aircraft to land. This is precisely what Brigadier General Penny of the Canadian Air Force did when he was Deputy Commander at NORAD during 9-11. That's why all the airplanes landed. PSYOP 1961, 80,000 targets were reviewed and 3,729 installations were translated into 1,060 designated ground zeros. 
Five options were developed for the American president. One, Soviet strategic retaliatory forces, including missile sites, bomb bases, and submarine pens. Although this doesn't really make any sense because if it's retaliatory, the Soviets have already launched their missiles out of their silos and you're basically firing nuclear weapons at empty silos. So this sounds more like a preemption plan. Number two, Soviet air defenses, which would then open up bomber routes to destroy the Soviet interior. Three, Soviet air defenses near cities. Four, Soviet command and control centers, mostly bunkers. And five, an all-out spasm attack, launch everything. In the picture, you can see B-83 nuclear bombs in storage at Barksdale Air Force Base. PSYOP 1962. There were three options. One, the Soviet Union and all its satellites, which included countries in Eastern Europe. Option two, no satellites. Option three, a, a preemptive or retaliatory attack. All missiles launched at once. You can see a US Polaris A3 being launched. And you can also see how the PSYOP target list was increased. You can see as the US strategic warheads increase, the associated PSYOP targets and the Soviet Russian strategic warheads. PSYOP 1963. Flexible options were introduced because this was at the time of the Kennedy administration. You could exclude national command authorities. This thought was thought important because you may want to negotiate with the Soviets rather than blowing up Moscow. And Kudyshev, which is to the east of Moscow, which is the main bunker complex for the Soviet leadership. You could exclude China and other states and various targets within countries. And there were four major attack options, MAOs, that were developed. In 1967, the U.S. had 32,000 warheads, which was the high point, and so it needed a lot of coordination. There was a massive PSYOP error in PSYOP 63, and this was only discovered in 1974 following a major review. The order to destroy 70% of overall manufacturing in the Soviet Union was taken to mean at least 70% of each and every factory would have to be destroyed including ones that would not have been targeted had there not been that misunderstanding. So the U.S. ended up targeting every single factory in the Soviet Union. Below is an older U.S. Lafayette-class ballistic missile submarine, one of the earlier models. PSYOP-5, 1976, had four Soviet target categories, nuclear, non-nuclear, leadership, and economic targets in the USSR. The U.S. could strike a cluster of targets as small as 100. There were also regional development plans that were developed. In this picture, you see a Soviet propaganda photo of Spetsnaz soldiers attacking a missile about to be launched. PSYOP-6, 1983. There was a new goal. This was after Jimmy Carter and during the Reagan administration. There was the concept of fighting and winning a protracted or long nuclear war for 180 days. The goal was the elimination of counter-recovery missions, and these were seen as ineffective, and beginning of targeting of mobile Soviet force targeting. So this is where the B-2 bomber comes in. The National Strategic Target Database, the NSTDB, increased to 25,000 and then 50,000 by the mid-1980s. It topped out with 150 to 160,000 potential targets worldwide, but then in 1987 it was reduced down to 14,000. Economic recovery targets are the attack on targets that could enhance a country's rebuilding after a nuclear war. These targets were cancelled after it was realized that North Korea recovered its pre-war GDP after only eight years from its level of only 20%. It had lost 80% of its industry by being bombed by the Americans during the Korean War. It was believed that a protracted nuclear war rather than a pre-programmed target set would be a better way of limiting the enemy's recovery. PSYOP 6F, 1989 targeting Soviet leadership and SS-25 mobile assets. The decapitation of targets. This means destroying the leadership, decapitation. 
The Soviets were able to hide 175,000 leadership elements, cadres of the Communist Party, in 1,500 underground bunker facilities, which made decapitation difficult. However, the U.S. Trident Sea Launch Ballistic Missile and the MX Missile, the, the Peacekeeper Missile, which is an ICBM, because of their accuracy, permitted targeting of these hardened bunkers. In September of 1988, the U.S. Defense Department began a program for deep penetration nuclear warheads. Typically, the warhead would be encased in depleted uranium-238 or tungsten. The U.S. also began a plan for integrated targeting of RTs, or relocatable targets. In other words, mobile Soviet targets. In 1985, the Soviets deployed the SS-25 road mobile ICBM and in 1987, the SS-24 rail mobile ICBM. So in 1987, the Pentagon began an integrated plan to destroy the RTs, and it consisted of the following elements. You can see here first a nuclear bunker buster piece. It shows the B-61-11. This is a more recent development. And you can see how the different kiloton ranged weapons can penetrate quite deeply. A 100 kiloton weapon can reach down as far as 220 feet, and a 1.2 megaton weapon can reach down as a thousand feet and that's if they're hardened and they're able to penetrate. But the origin of this goes back to decapitation plans against Soviet leadership. So the first element was the Aurora stealth vehicle which could move at Mach 5 at a hundred thousand feet. It was possibly cancelled in 1993. Number two, unmanned remote sensing devices, what today we call drones. These would have been flown remotely over the Soviet Union to identify the SS-24s and the SS-25s. The Magnum and Mentor geostationary signals intelligence satellites, which were launched in January of 1985 and November of 1989. Each satellite cost over one billion and provided the ability to look for ground targets. Four and other KH-12 photographic intelligence satellites that facilitated visual surveillance of the Soviet Union. Number five, LaCrosse all-weather radar imaging satellites. These satellites had radars powerful enough to look through clouds. Each satellite cost over half a billion. The B-2 stealth bomber, which at nighttime would fly to the Soviet Union, hovering over it for many hours, destroying and chasing targets, probably in conjunction with ground-based special forces, and then would leave before daytime came. Rapid launch of Minutemen and MX missiles on mobile targets if it became necessary to use nuclear weapons against these targets. And finally, soft kill electromagnetic weapons. Weapons that, without necessarily being nuclear, are able to disrupt the electronics of uh, Soviet systems so they couldn't launch their missiles. These were developed in the 19. 80s. And many of the programs that exist today are a result of this program. So there are updates to PSYOP in the time period 1990 to 1996, which is the end of the Cold War. Eastern Europe was taken off of the list. Many of these countries later joined NATO. Iran, Iraq, Libya, Syria, and North Korea received detailed targeting and development of quick targeting strategic reserve options. There were four basic counterforce options, MA-01, 2, 3, and 4. MA-01 was basic counterforce plan, basically hitting the enemy's military forces. MA-02 was inclusive of MA-01, and it included conventional military targets and secondary airfields. MA-03 was all of the above, plus leadership. And MA-04 was everything, plus major economic targets. Despite the end of the Cold War, PSYOP 2001 continued with 2,000 targets in the former Soviet Union including Russia and its neighbors. Three to four hundred targets in China and hundred to two hundred targets elsewhere. Planning time is an average of 14 to 18 months. PSYOP 94, 1994 took 67 weeks. It would also take just a few hours to set up forces to strike targets in the developing world that were not on the original PSYOP target list. STRATCOM, or Strategic Command, that's responsible for the nuclear missiles and the bombers, also draws up regional nuclear attack plans, including to fire its nuclear-tipped sea-launched cruise missiles. Recently, PSYOP is being phased out and replaced with a more flexible planning system. 
Now, the Americans planned against the Soviet RISOP, which is the Red Integrated Strategic Offensive Plan. So the Americans had at the Pentagon a staff that simulated a Soviet PSYOP against American targets. And they would then run these to see what the US would have to do to deal with a Soviet threat. Here are SS-25s deployed in the forest from a Soviet military power publication. These were publications in the 1980s, uh, done during the Reagan administration, which gave outlines every year of developments in the Soviet Union. It was a very popular and influential publication, even if the artwork was a little bit, um, a little bit grade school-ish. So the Soviet PSYOP equivalent is termed the plan of operations of the strategic forces. The Soviets had tapes that were geographically specific so that nuclear missiles had to be launched from a specific point or they would not work at all. This was partially because the Soviet leadership did not trust their own naval personnel. Here you can see SS-25 road mobile ICBMs in their garages. This is an SS-25 Soviet road mobile ICBM. These are the different bases where the SS-25s are located. This is a picture map of one of those bases at Irkutsk. And you can see the different deployment areas outside of the base and how they link up on the highway system. This is the Teikovo SS-25 base. This is an SS-24 rail mobile ICBM. This is the missile erector out of the train. This is the Kostrama SS-24 rail base and the rail parking area for the missiles. This is a simulated attack on Kostrama base. It shows the range of the effect of a nuclear attack and the probability of destroying the Soviet SS-24 rail system. This was done by an NGO in the US and it was meant to highlight the fact that the Soviet mobile systems are in fact quite vulnerable. These are Soviet targets in the US which were somehow obtained by the US. There was during the Cold War a big debate over how much equivalent megatonnage was required to assure the destruction of an enemy. And this is important because without this, you may not have credible deterrence because you have to promise overwhelming punishment in order to deter an enemy from trying a policy. And so these different authors identified and they all agreed that the US had 220 equivalent megatons of capacity, but the question was how much would be required to convincingly weaken the Soviets. And the range here from Doherty was 100 equivalent megatons, which is that the US had 221 over capacity, or rather 121% over capacity, to Grieco, who said the US actually only had half as much as what they needed. So each of these authors wrote about it and had their own calculations that can be compared with each other. Here you can see counterforce destruction of the USSR. These are silos, not cities, being targeted. And yet, you still have a lot of radiation from the fallout. The capacity uh, it must, must be greater than uh, the equivalent megatonnage because uh, certainly the US and the Soviet Union had far more than that equivalent megatonnage in just a few missiles. So it must be uh, another measure it could be um, a, a value um, that's 100 times greater than an equivalent megaton. In any case, you have the same authors who did a later uh, study, um, again, disagreeing with each other. And you can see Robert McNamara in there as well. And uh, here, it was a model of the Soviets attacking the US and looking as, as to whether the Soviets had enough or not enough to completely destroy the US. You can see here a Soviet SS-9 ICBM. You can see here the fallout pattern 
if there was an attack by the Soviets exclusively against counterforce targets, against U.S. strategic nuclear weapons, silos, and air bases and naval bases. And still there is an enormous amount of radiation, although it's mostly in the Midwest and places like Montana, where fewer people live. 